before I start the talk, I want to do a, a quick old-fashioned screech type survey <laughs> of, every, of everybody in here. I, I, I'm, I'm just always interested when I speak to different groups to see um, what, what kind of answers I get about this. I'd, I'd like someone throw out a number. How many microcontrollers and sensors do you think are in this arm that I am wearing right now? Six? Okay, let, let's go with six. More or less. Everybody in the audience, raise your hand if you think it's more. Okay, raise your hand if you think it's less. Okay, interesting. I th I'd say we're about, what, like 60, 40, something like that. Uh, most people think it's more than six. All right. So in the spring of, of 2004, I was a grad student in a uh, nanotechnology lab at Duke University uh, working on atomic force microscopy, um, riding one of the great waves of research funding uh, that we got going on now in a lab that had reinvented itself after riding one of the other great wa waves in the 80s, which was uh, acoustics and vibration. <laughs> And, and, uh, and I had come from a lab at NC State that had made a very similar transition from uh, acoustics and vibration to uh, uh, medical and biotechnology. Um, in uh, early, uh, it, later in that spring, I joined a reserve unit, in, uh, Marine Reserve Unit in Lynchburg, Virginia. And less than 48 hours after I swore in, uh, we got a warning order to activate and go to Iraq. So I found myself um, very quickly in Anbar province uh, in Iraq. And not too long after that, four and a half months later, on New Year's Day, um, I was blown up by an improvised explosive device and, which uh, killed Lance Corporal Brian Perello. And I consider myself very lucky to be here uh, talking to you right now. I started off, uh, as soon as I got home, you could see that picture of my son and I uh, sort of contemplating my arm, uh, figuring out what uh, we could do a as a society and uh, our medical apparatus could do to replace that norm arm. And apparently from your answer to that first question, you, as I did at the time, uh, my thoughts about prosthetics were mostly informed by science fiction. And, and not by science itself. The reality uh, that I found out, uh, this, this arm is a body-powered arm, uh, like you can see the little girl in the picture they're wearing, and um, it, it's controlled uh, by this rubber band that holds it shut and a cable that goes over my shoulder to open it. Uh, this was patented in 1912 by a guy named Dorrance. Um, still has his name on the hook, uh, despite two corporate acquisitions, uh, since he had anything to do with the company. Uh, Ninety percent of arm amputees uh, wear a, a prosthesis like that, if they wear one at all. In fact, the uh, half do not wear one. And uh, the, the uh, electronic devices are worn by a small uh, five percent of all amputees. W this is a reflection, I believe, of a media bias. It's not the bias that many of you uh, might think, uh, a, a left or right political bias. Um, it's, in fact, a, a an affection that the media has on our behalf for really good stories and really bad stories. Uh, on the right, you might recognize uh, a picture of a specialist at Walter Reed showing us the mold in his room. Um, and on the left, Staff Sergeant uh, Heath Calhoun uh, playing golf with uh, two sea legs. Uh, and in fact, the, the reality is sort of more in the middle and more complicated. You might not know uh, that specialist Decker, if you go to the Washington Post interview with him on their website right now, uh, says that he believes he's getting the best medical care in the world at Walter Reed. Um, and you might be surprised to find out that prosthetics aren't necessarily as great uh, as you might think from what most of what you see on the media. And in fact, here I am on 60 Minutes demonstrating uh, some uh, skin surface EMG sensing technology um, and a hand that was supposed to come out last year and hasn't come out yet. Um, and even after I was very careful, I spent probably half the day telling 60 Minutes that the real story here uh, was, was about the economics of, of providing arms, and uh, what we got was a minute and a half of gee whiz thought controlled arms. And that's, <laughs> that's something that's very distressing to me. Um, so, you know, yes, the story is complicated. This is not a disaster. We are doing the best that we can, but what we have to 
to put on people is simply not as good as we think it is. And, uh, and this is what I call the $6 million meme. So a meme, as you may know, I mean, it has sort of wide-ranging definitions, but you know, some people describe uh, getting Rickrolled, you know, seeing Rick Astley singing, I'm never gonna give you up as a meme. I think that's a little bit of a stretch. I would say that, that, that a meme, you know, in, in the most useful definition of the word, is an idea that travels very quickly virally, that people, uh, that resonates with people and, and is capable of spreading. And so the, the $6 million meme, I would say, is, is the impression that uh, thought controlled arms are here and that we have licked this problem uh, when, when in fact we haven't. This is some video that we shot of some of the things that I can do with this 1912 arm. Throwing a koosh ball around, eating grapes. <laughs> Tying my shoes. <laughs> Opening a beer. <laughs> I'm pretty happy about that. <laughs> so, what I think that. Um, that, that it's important to understand is that yes, we don't have thought controlled arms, but this, this arm that others have described as uh, something hearkening back to Captain Hook or uh, a rubber band and a hook on a stick is, is in fact a little bit uh, more successful despite its low technology and, and you know, in some ways represents a kind of appropriate technology sort of to get to the thrust of Dr. Dr. Malkin's talk in intent. Uh, here, here's a timeline that shows the 1912 patent, uh, what this stuff looked like uh, after World War II and the mold from today. Uh, here's the myoelectric stuff. You can see how Autobox hand that I was see received at Walter Reed looks very much like one of the hands uh, from, from the 60s on which it was based. Uh, here's the 1983 patent for the Autobot Greifer, which you may uh, recognize in Willow Garage's robot. Uh, they copied that and made it out of metal. Um, and that's the one I got at Walter Reed today. Imagine with me for a moment, oh, here's a Mayo uh, hook from a one of the first Mayo demonstrations in the 50s, and I got one of these at Walter Reed, too. Um, all this stuff's in my closet. I like this thing better. Um, imagine with me for a moment if other technology in your lives uh, advanced at the same pace uh, that prosthetic arm technology has advanced. Uh, like your telephone, like your Mercedes, uh, perhaps, well, okay, so, so how many of you don't know what that is on the left? <laughs> okay, so that's a, that's a slide rule. I do know from uh, NC State where I went to school that I, that I, I believe that the uh, last engineering class at NC State that used a slide rule was something around 83, 84. Um, that's an IBM 650 computer. It costs like a million bucks, took up a whole room, and it could add 28 columns of figures. <laughs> so, so, okay, so why, why is this? It's the market. It's about the market. Um, here are some real markets. You can't see the numbers on the left. Uh, this is uh, like $10 billion, $14 billion for razors and razor blades, uh, like $17 billion for video game hardware and software. Uh, something like a, a three or four for erectile dysfunction drugs. I promise you that there's something like a very generous hundred million dollars over there for powered arms. And here, uh, you know, the, the, the DARPA project in which I was involved uh, has been described as a, a moon race or a Manhattan project for arms. And I think it's important, uh, you know, as I'm pointing out what we actually have accomplished in contrast with the media likes to say we've accomplished, that in fact it's been done so with a very impressive budget given the task. Um, you know, this may be a Manhattan project in terms of what was required, but it is not a Manhattan project in terms of funding allocation. Oh, and the, uh, the Joint Strike Fighter budget there, that is R&D only, that's no procurement. Um, and so, so to some of the other comments, um, you know, if, if, you, if you want to create a moon rocket or a bomb or an advanced uh, strike fighter, you create an engineering program to achieve that stuff or a research program to achieve that stuff. Um, you know, I, I think that there, there is somewhat of a myth that uh, some of these benefits uh, just sort of, sort of happen. If you wanted uh, an instant breakfast drink or 
uh, you know, something to reduce friction in your pan or on your pipes or stick stuff, uh, you probably would not set out to build a moon rock in order to achieve those things. In fact, th this website, in fact, points out that none of these things, although they were used by the space program, none of them were developed by the space program. Um, and so I, so I think that the, um, the you know, I, I think we do have a tension that we must acknowledge uh, between engineering projects which often tend to be very focused and set out to achieve a very particular goal and basic science projects which uh, may certainly have benefits that we might not anticipate at the beginning um, but can't be expected to achieve very specific benefits if we do not fund them as we pursue those basic science goals. Um, and, and so in terms of um, the, the particular problem that I'm trying to solve, uh, what we really have is a multiple market failure. Um, government is really the only game in town in terms of spending, and yet um, you know, we, we've failed really to achieve advances that sort of seem uh, reasonable given what we've accomplished in other areas. Um, the private, private industry has not stepped in because the kinds of markets that I showed you uh, you know, and, and mine is only one. Um, there are underserved markets of every kind are not the kinds of things that get venture capitalist hearts pumping. Um, and, you know, academia is, you know, as a partner of government research, um, you know, is, is often uh, a group that offers uh, solutions uh, in search of problems. Um, you know, the, the, if you have a lab that happens to do neuro research, it might like to identify itself with a prosthetic pro program as a justification uh, whether or not um, sticking an invasive sensor in somebody's brain is an appropriate solution to that problem. Um, I, I, I would argue that it is not and we can talk about that at another time. Uh, what we have in prosthetics is a, is a chicken and egg problem. We need to get information out of uh, a person for intent and we need to deliver it to a device that's capable of using that. We've been missing uh, sort of both pieces of that. We haven't had a highly articulated hand uh, to do our bidding in part because we haven't had uh, the, the, the sensors that required that high degree of articulation. Um, I would argue that we do not have a shortage of ideas. Ideas might be worth a dime a dozen, they might be worth less. Um, the problem is not good ideas, it's implementation, particularly when we're talking about hardware, medical devices, these kinds of things. You can uh, you know, sketch all you want and imagine what you would put together if you had the money, but uh, you know, when you're talking about hardware, you actually have to build something. You actually have to make something, and, and otherwise all you have is a concept car. In fact, even if you build something, unless you've actually designed it for production and you have taken into account the cost, um, you know, notwithstanding some of what Dr. Malkin has, has discovered, um, you know, if, if right now in the current reimbursement environment, if I deliver an arm that costs three hundred fifty thousand dollars, and insurance companies won't right now pay for one that costs thirty-five, um, I have not really done much to solve the problem. Um, so, to quote uh, Dean Kamen, uh, he likes to say that what we need to do uh, is not force everybody un under the bar, but we need to raise the bar. Um, I would take that a step further. I'd actually like to force people over the bar. Um, and how, how might we do that? Um, I don't have time to go into all of these right now, but I think we need to take advantage of larger markets, products uh, in industrial robotics, other things, uh, batteries. The prosthetics industry shouldn't develop a battery when the cell phone industry is doing it for us, for example. Uh, we should design for other markets. Maybe we need to make a video game controller based on the technology we need so that when you can buy it as a $20, uh, $50 Wiimote, uh, then we can actually take advantage of it. We need to use uh, social networking and not in a stupid way. Uh, we, <laughs> like throwing sheep at each other, turning each other into vampires, uh, you know, your cousin's extremely weird avatar on Second Life, whatever. Uh, Open source software, I'm a big fan of. I'm also a big fan of open hardware and open architecture, and I can talk about all those. In the end, this is, this is the other thing that I propose is necessary uh, in, in order for us to solve this problem is that we listen better to patients. I don't think uh, in a lot of cases that people are designing the arms that those of us who are missing them would actually like. Um, in some cases, I think people look at somebody like me, and the only thing that they can think about or relate to is 
gosh, I wouldn't want to walk down the street wearing that thing. Well, okay, so I, I'm not 25 years old. I'm, I'm not female. I'm married. There are factors that make this a little bit easier for me, but also at the end of the day, there, 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 there are functional considerations, and I think that it's a lot easier uh, to simply imagine the cosmetic ones. And so I think that a lot of prosthetic arms have been designed for the two-handed and to make the, the two-handed feel better. Um, I'd like to start a, uh, a company that's 51% owned by service-disabled veterans so that we who have skin in the game uh, can actually help determine what it is that we might build and what it is that we want. And I invite all of you in uh, academia and in industry to help me do it. Um, I, we, we need this help. I think that between among these three research universities that we have in this area, uh, we have the resources to do some amazing things. So, uh, sir, I, I, I would like to talk to you about how we can do this. <laughs> And uh, I've been out of time for a couple minutes now, so, uh, so, so I'll close there. But uh, we can do better, and, and I invite all of you to help me do it. Thanks.